And you are watching PBS Books. Hi, I'm Fred Nahat. Nice to have you along with us for our conversations around the 100th anniversary of ratification of the 19th Amendment. It is the first in a series of events on trailblazing American women writers, all made possible with the generous support of the National Endowment for the Arts and the William and Jean Clark Rhodes Foundation. And so we begin as we highlight some incredible authors, uh, their lives, uh, their accomplishments, the impact they have had on so many others. Uh, and of course, in areas uh, no less important uh, than breaking barriers uh, in American uh, democracy. Going to talk to uh, poet, author, writer, Professor Ada Lamone in just a moment. But right now, I want to welcome in uh, Heather Marie Matia, who is the Library Bureau Chief of uh, PBS Books. Heather, how are you? I'm great, Fred. It's so wonderful to be here tonight. Um, we're so thrilled to continue the celebration of the 19th Amendment and, and launching that with um, the Trailblazing American Women's Writers Project. And this series is just, it's something we're, we're so excited to share with libraries across the country, as well as local PBS stations. Yeah, a little, a little background around PBS books. Of, of, of course, we're bringing you these live streams covering uh, national book fairs. We brought you the Library of Congress National Book Fair to our documentary a couple of uh, weeks back. But we are also on the ground interconnected with uh, partners across the country, including libraries, but Heather, I know putting this Writers Project series together, again, depends on uh, partnerships. Tell us about who's working with us on this project. You know, we're so excited to be able to really partner with girl empowerment um, programs across the country, as well as women writers associations, including the Kentucky Women's Writers Association. Um, and, and we're working in conjunction with libraries, obviously, 1700 Libraries Strong, we're, we're working to really um, bring this amazing content to hopefully inspire young writers across the country, young women, young girls, to learn about this, this, this trailblazing um, women's content and to inspire young, young girls to be able to write and, and do more in the future. All right, Heather, uh, don't go far. You're going to join me in this conversation coming up with award-winning poet Ada Lamone author of five poetry collections and a current Guggenheim Fellow. But first, let's learn a little bit more about Ada Lamone and her work. Let's watch. Ada Lamone was born in Sonoma, California. The daughter of an artist and a teacher, she moved to New York City to earn her MFA from the creative writing program at NYU. Now, she lives in Kentucky, Lamone was awarded a 2020 Guggenheim Fellowship. Her work has garnered attention and accolades because of its accessibility to readers, strong imagery, and pointed conclusions. For me, a lot of what I ask myself to do in creating my own work is to risk something. And I want to walk that line of the fear, <laughs> being a little terrified of the work. And a lot of times that's because, you know, the this, this scrim of emotion is right there. And I gotta pierce it, you know? Lamone's work never downplays the complexity of our world, of our relationships, or even of herself. Her fifth book, The Carrying, finds its trailblazing impact in how candid Lamone is in her struggles with infertility, her country, and what it means to be a woman. The Carrying won the National Book Critics Circle Award for poetry and was named one of the top five poetry books of the year by the Washington Post. Her fourth book, Bright Dead Things, was named a finalist for the National Book Award among several others. You know, I think it's interesting because I've always thought that poetry and poets are at the forefront of the way things shift. You know, I think that if there's an issue with our society, um, poets are at that at that line, making sure that we're observing everything that's happening. And so to be in that group or to be included in that kind of community has been really wonderful. And I think that with poetry, we're a little quieter. We're a little sometimes more in the back, um, but the platforms have shifted mm -hmm. and it's allowing our voices to be heard. Uh, and we are back uh, on PBS Books uh, celebrating um, the work of uh, Ada Lamone. We're going to meet in uh, just a moment, but let's give her a proper introduction. 
Uh, the poet Ada Limon, uh, a current Guggenheim fellow, the author of five poetry collections, the most recent of which, The Carrying, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry. Her fourth book, White Dead Things, was a finalist for the National Book Award, among many others. Currently, Ada on faculty, Queens University of Charlotte, North Carolina, and their MFA program. Ada, welcome uh, to PBS Books. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. I also want to welcome in uh, Heather Marie Mantia, who is our library bureau chief. Join us uh, in this uh, conversation. Uh, we're excited about this. Uh, Heather, I know we put a lot of work uh, into uh, this series, had some great funders and sponsors, uh, but now it's so fun because Ada uh, has joined us. All right, uh, let's get let's get started. We have questions um, fully prepared on our end, but also we want to hear from our viewers. If you're watching us on Facebook or on the PBS uh, Books stream, hit us with some questions and we will ask uh, Ada the questions uh, at the end of the conversation. All right, uh, Ada, I'm gonna start with a simple one. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, gosh, uh, times, uh, things, uh, our lives have changed so much uh, in the last uh, three quarters of a year or so. How has it impacted you, uh, your daily routine, your writing, your creative process? Yeah. Um... It is, it is very, it's a very strange time. Um, I, I think in the very beginning, I had a lot of fear and anxiety and I'm not saying that's necessarily gone away, but I do think I've shifted into somewhat of a routine and maybe many of us have where we're starting to, you know, work from home and now it's becoming a little bit more of an, of the norm, but, um, yeah, I, the, I think the, the most, the biggest thing for me is that I am primarily live a life on the road. I, I travel to universities and to places where people um, ask me to come speak. And I always love it. I'm really grateful for that t chance to connect. And um, and now I'm doing it from, from my office. Uh, so um, so it's, it's interesting. I think in some ways I've been able to... <sighs> I, I don't want to say write more because I don't think that's the case, but I have been able to spend a little bit more time um, reading and editing and looking at my work and writing a bit um, because I'm not on the road quite as much. Uh, but the fact of the world and its mayhem and anxiety uh, inducing stream of events um, has got has kept me uh, has kept me on my toes. I don't feel like it's a, a vacation. I feel very uh, very ill at ease, and I'm I'm ready for the pandemic to be over. Um, but I am trying to find silver linings here and there, just just to survive. You know, just yeah. to have hope. Yeah, good advice, Heather. Ada, if you can think a little bit about um, your background and and how your parents, being the daughter of a creative an artist, I believe, and an executor, how that influenced your process and even influences your process today. Yeah. Uh, so my mother is a painter uh, and uh, I grew up with, you know, her, she did many things. She was a painter primarily, but also did ceramics. Um, and then my father uh, was actually my elementary school principal. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, you know, I think it's kind of interesting because I do think that I grew up in an artist community in Sonoma and Glen Ellen, California. Um, my stepfather and my father were both both wrote. My father plays guitar. They're very creative people. Um, my stepfather wrote. I, it was very um, important, I think, in my life to have those models. Um, that creativity was not just an outlet, but it was a really important aspect of daily living. Um, and I feel very lucky to have to have that and have seen that growing up because I don't think many people have that opportunity. Um, but so I think it, in a lot of ways, it gave me permission. It gave me permission to pursue creative writing, poetry, the arts in a way that I don't know, um, I don't know if I would have been brave enough if I hadn't had their their support and also their modeling. Well, if you're thinking about uh, undercurrent conditions, uh, mm -hmm. obviously things are topsy turvy. They're they're upside down in so in so many ways. But going back, at least for me, uh, in school, poetry seemed 
um, rather inaccessible. Mm. Is there been forward momentum, uh, more progress in the sense that people are expressing themselves through social media and breaking through those barriers of uh, meter and rhyme scheme? What is sort of the state of, of poetry and young people taking it on? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's really, it's, I think it's a really exciting time for poetry. Um, I mean, again, I, I I was from a community of writers and, and artists, and so for me, that it's always seemed like an alive place for poetry. Um, but I do think it has gotten more so, and I am very um, encouraged. Everywhere I go, it used to be, I mean, I would even say 10 years ago, if I said I was a poet, people would kind of go, oh. Um, <laughs> and, and now I think that even that is like, oh, what do you do? What do you write? I, I know some poetry. I think that there's... People are reading it more. People are engaging with it more on social media platforms. Um, and I also think that there is something about poetry wanting to really speak to people, that it's no longer seen as something that just speaks to other poets, mm. but and that you don't have to be in the arts to appreciate the art. And I think that has been a big shift um, and an important shift. So in terms of, as you think of that shift, right, there was a moment where I, I, I would say incredible trailblazing women like Sylvia Plath and Gwendolyn Brooks um, and even Sonia Sanchez, who, who have really um, used their poetry as a tool um, to provide a voice for women and women's thoughts, women's emotions, women's political views. Mm -hmm. How do you think of um, this year being the 19th, uh, the, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, um, the centennial celebration. How have you? How has that influenced you? And how have you been able to to share your voice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we often talk about right a vote being a voice, <laughs> and I think we talk a, a lot about voice in poetry um, and what that means, and being able to actually make something, create something and put it into the world is maybe my greatest pleasure. The actual making of the thing and then sharing it uh, is the thing that brings me the most joy. Um, and I do think that there's power in that. And I do think that it is, you know, that aspect of, of, of the, the legacy. There's a reason why I am allowed to do this, right? And it comes from all the work that was done before. Everyone who was fighting for people to have the, the chance to vote. I mean, even when you go back to like, what, 1851 with Sardona Truth's wonderful speech, Ain't I a Woman, right? Like to the, to, the voting, to the Voting Rights Act in 1965. I mean, all of these things are, have a lot to do with why I can even write, why I can be here, why I can feel like I have value as a person. And I love that you bring up, um, the 19th Amendment, because I actually wrote a poem and it was commissioned by the Academy of American Poets and the New York Philharmonic. But um, it sort of envisioning what it must have felt like to vote as a woman for the very first time. And it's a short one, so I'll go ahead and read it. What it must have felt like. Palm sized and fledgling, a beak protruding from the sleeve. I have kept my birds muted for so long. I fear they have grown accustomed to a quiet gratitude. What chaos could ensue should a wing get loose? Come over to burst, come flock, swarm, talon and claw, scatter the coop's roost, free the signet and its shadow. Crack and scratch at the state's cage, Cut through clouds and branch, no matter the dumb hourglass's white sand, yawning grain by grain. What cannot be contained, cannot be contained. Mm, the white signet in the shadow. Uh, I mean, that there are a lot of shadows today. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. uh, you talk about power. There's good power. There's bad power. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we know kind of the uh, the storytelling construct of power. But what when it comes to real issues, our, you know, our own story and and the social commentary uh, that poets and poet 
poetry can provide? Is there a what what is the what is poetry's superpower mm-hmm. in social commentary? Yeah, I think that's um, that's a wonderful question. I mean, I think that po- poetry has a lot of superpowers, but mm-hmm. I'm biased. Um, I uh, but I think it primarily, especially right now, when we're dealing with like how can we connect um, or how can we talk about these impossible subjects, this impossible time, this heaviness of grief. Um, I think its superpower is that it leaves room for complexity and mystery and an unknowing. Um, I think that oftentimes when we think about writing in prose, right, if we write an essay or an article, we're thinking we have to have an answer, we have to have a point of view, we have to make sure that we have a thesis and a solution. Um, And I think with poetry, as in with real life, we don't have those things. We ha- we're much more willing to accept sort of the mystery in that we don't know what's next. We don't know what's coming. Um, and so poetry has that capacity to do both of those things, right? To hold all of those clues at once and to make room for, for mystery and, and beauty, um, even in really dark times. Yeah. Huh. And, and along that mystery, you know, I know a lot of your poetry deals with vulnerable themes. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with birth and death and chronic illness and infertility. Mm -hmm. Um, How do you, how do you balance that of writing about such taboo subjects Mm -hmm. and still being able to have a voice and that, I mean, I don't find your poetry it's not that it's depressing. Like I want to read more. I want to discover more that mystery. Right. Um, So how do you find that balance? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's the life's question, right? (laughs) How do we, how do we find the balance between the dark and the light? Um, I can tell you, I work really hard at it. I work really hard um, to be like the plants and lean towards the light. I think, um, I think I, uh, I think that I write poetry to really write myself back into the world um, and to be a part of the world and feel connected and to survive. And so I think when I am dealing with those big issues, if it's chronic pain or if it's um, when I was dealing with infertility, um, I'm happily child free now, so don't worry about me. But um, I, you know, I do think that I had to find those little moments of, of delight, of joy, of appreciation, and also just deep, deep gratitude, um, which I know, you know, we, we talk about a lot and everyone has, has said that before, but I think it's something that's really important because I do think it's how we continue. Um, and so I think that for me and my own work, the balance is really about my own humanity and balancing my own survival, right? So if I'm if I'm feeling in a dark place, I'm willing to explore and go there, but I've got to know that I can I can walk up the rung of that ladder back out the well and see the sun. Um, and I think the safety of knowing that the ladder is there allows me to go down into the well. Well, you know, and I'm glad, I'm glad you went there because the the other thing that strikes me uh, in doing the work that you do, and certainly it has to be so much discipline uh, and setting aside those uh, those hours to, you know, be reflective, be, you know, absorbing or maybe absorbing on one day and reflective on the other. How, what is your what is your writing process? Do you lock yourself away? Do you, you know, are you you know, you do like Henry David Thoreau and, and, and get out, in the, out of doors. Like what, what, how do you manifest uh, your physical self while you're writing or getting inspired? Yeah. Um, I, I will say that my routine has shifted a little bit during this time. Um, and I think it's primarily because there are moments when there is so much happening and it's so overwhelming for me that I, there's no way I can write. Um, and so I think that my job is to receive and to listen. And so it's been coming in different ways. Um, I wrote almost every single day for the month of April and every single day for the month of June. Um, and then in July, I, I, I stopped and it felt like I just needed to absorb and, and be present and listen and sort of receive the world versus you know put myself into the world. Um, 
And so right now I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of starting to write again and I'm listening to that. It's basically, I feel like when it comes, it comes. It, I, um, students kind of hate me because they'll ask me what I do uh, for writer's block. And I say, oh, I just don't write. <laughs> but, uh, but no one's, you know, I, I don't have a poem due. So it's okay for me to say that. Um, but I, I think right now I'm allowing myself to, um, to be quiet and to process and to grieve um, and not always have to feel like about, you know, being productive. Um, so I think it's changing, but I'm doing a lot of editing and, and writing is coming, but it's, it's coming in fits and starts, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ada, often someone's background or their heritage influence the work that they do and their perspective on the world. Mm -hmm. um, so my question for you is how your heritage influenced your work and influences your writing today. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, like as a Latinx person, I think that I, one of the ways that I'm influenced is that I really do feel, and I don't want to say that this is unique to me, but I, I am very aware of, the generation that didn't have the opportunity to explore the arts because they were really trying to make a living and, and find safety. Mm -hmm. And I think about my grandfather quite a bit who, uh, you know, when he crossed the border, lived in a chicken coop and then went on to become, you know, to graduate from San Diego State. Uh, but you know he was an incredibly artistic person he was a dancer and a singer and actor and he had all this creative energy um but you know he worked for Con Edison because that's what you did and i i think about him a lot and i think um you know i think that there's a part of me that never takes this for granted mm -hmm. yeah that's you know part i i guess i think for all of us we all want to be as progressive as we can be the, you know, the arc of history, as long as it takes, it bends towards justice. Ultimately we hope. Um, but there are a number of reasons why we, in the context of the trailblazing American women, if you go back to our conversation, we had a few weeks ago about Emily Dickinson, there's several reasons why she wasn't prolific until after her passing. But part of that on the run up was it was a different society. People wrote about different ideals. There was different positioning. And like you said, you know, one bottle of whiskey in the cupboard, you know, did it for medicinal purposes, different world. What do, what, what of cancel culture? And if you go back and you think of not to say anyone specifically, but you know, it's like Emerson or uh, Whitman, people of a different time, what do we do with their catalog? And I, at least I feel like that's something for us to revere and learn from and move forward. What are your thoughts on that? You know, I think that's an interesting question, and I think uh, I think it's important uh, to interrogate the work. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and I think that where we get in trouble is when we don't interrogate it; that we sort of take it as like this is this is the greatest work of all time, mm -hmm. and I was taught that when I was coming up, and so now I'm going to teach you that this is the greatest work of all time, and you know, and it happens to be all of these white men or whatever, you know, whatever it is that we're, we're, we're dealing with. And I think we need to interrogate what, why it was that we had that impression, why it is that um, we aren't including women and, you know, women of color in the canon as much as we should. Um, and I think that, that, uh, that sometimes it just takes, it takes a little more work. Yeah. And, is it because it is the greatest work of all time or is it because we haven't done the work? Um, and so I think, you know, I, I certainly want to keep reading everyone, um, but I want that canon to, to explode, if you will. I want it to get wider and wider and wider. And I think it just needs to blossom outward. And I think the more we do that, um, I think the better we're gonna be as not only readers, but as people. As a follow-up question to that, if you were to pick, as you expand that canon, three influential female writers, who would you who would you add to that canon? Who would you say you must read those people? Wow. Um, 
I think, I mean, some of these people, it depends on your canon, right? Uh, some of these people will probably be oh. in, but I would definitely, um, I would definitely make sure Audrey Lord is read more and, um, she's an incredible amount of work. And I think, uh, she's often, you know, maybe you get one or two poems of hers, but really she's a phenomenal poet. Um, I think, um, Gabriela Mistral, the Chilean poet, um, who, you know, won the Nobel Prize and uh, was Neruda's teacher. And we hear much more about Neruda than we do about Mistral. And I think that's someone I would I would add to the canon. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, I, I think I would add uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, even though even though we study Brooks, I don't think that we do the deep dive. I, I, I think she deserves much more of uh, of a deep dive than, than she gets. Yeah, it, it, certainly an accomplished uh, list. We often like to ask our guests their, um, their advice for young people who, you know, want to be creative and take that into their uh, their own life, maybe for a career, maybe it's a more of an avocation. But, but I'm also curious, uh, what advice would you give to folks who are maybe in midlife and felt like I missed my chance? Is it ever too late to pick up the pen, the pencil, the computer and um, write some poetry? No, I don't think it's ever too late. I mean, I really don't. I, uh, I, uh, I mean, I, I play terrible guitar, but I still pick it up <laughs> and uh, I still find joy out of it. And I think there's an importance, a real importance, especially now in joy and finding areas to play and explore. Um, the world is never going to be worse for more poets. Like, go ahead, make more poets, make more poetry. Like, there's no, that, that to me can never go wrong. I think, um, I also think that, you know, you begin by reading. So if you're reading a lot of poetry and that inspires you to write, absolutely, absolutely start. I don't think, um, I don't think it's too late at all. Hey guys, I want to remind you, we're talking to Ada Lamone here on uh, PBS Books. We are now getting into the portion of the program. We want to take your viewer questions. So hit us with those questions on Facebook or live on uh, the stream. Heather, let me throw it to you if you got a final or if you want to kick it to a viewer question and ask the first one. I'd like to ask the first viewer question, which is what motivates you to keep you writing? Mm. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think that I feel it's a, it's a way of giving back. <laughs> it's a way of recognizing awe and wonder and, um, and, and talking back to this, this life. I feel very, I feel like it's important to witness uh, what's happening. And um, when a poem comes, it feels like it's coming out of a place of really acknowledging and noticing and a deep paying attention. And so that's what keeps me going is just that deep noticing, paying attention and feeling like, like it is actually giving something back to the world. Uh, this next question might be a plant. It's from someone named Patsy. What is your uh, next project? Have you decided? And if so, can you let us know what it is? Oh, is that my Aunt Patsy? Looks like it. <laughs> Hi, Aunt Patsy. Um, I, uh, what is my next project? Well, I think I am, I, I mean, I haven't even told anyone this, but I, I think I'm starting to put together the sixth book. Um, but it's going to be a while. Uh, and I think that what I'm trying to work on and what the poems seem to be working on uh, are the idea of revival and what comes back. Um, so, you know, it may take me a while to finish because I think I'm still crawling out of the darkness. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think I think that's that's where uh, that's where it's going. But yeah, I'm just now starting to put together the sixth book. All right. Another question. Uh, when did uh, when did you first want to be a writer? And as a follow up to that, when did you know that you were one? Oh, am I? Yeah, it's, I think it took me a long time to say I'm a writer. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I still think that sometimes I swallow hard saying it, you know, like, am I? Um, <laughs> I mean, most of us have that, right? The imposter syndrome. Uh, I think that I first realized that uh, when I was actually a junior and senior at the University of Washington, I was a theater major 
And I spent a lot of time studying wonderful plays and great authors and, and studying acting. And um, at one point I started taking poetry classes and I was so really addicted immediately to the idea of what it is to use the breath and the body to make images and, you know, and sounds on the page that could reverberate and hold emotional content and meaning and narrative. And um, I thought, oh, this whole time I've been studying what it is to embody other people's words. Maybe it's time to, to embody my own. And that was, that was, so I was, I was quite young. Um, I was a junior, it was either junior year or junior year when I really felt that. Um, and then I don't think I, I don't think I really was able to call myself a poet until um, my first book came out. And even then um, it was probably easier to say, oh, I, I work for magazines or, you know, I had many different jobs and I would sort of say that first and then oh, I, I also write poetry, you know, um, but, but yeah. Another viewer asked, um, when an early draft fails, or if an early draft fails, do you feel it is because of trouble with form, language, not being present, or maybe not being honest enough with the poem? What do you think it, what's the cause of that failure? Yeah, the worst is when all those things happen at once. <laughs> um, no, I think, uh, I think for me, almost always, I say it's honesty. Almost always. If it's really failing, it's because I am not being honest with myself, and I'm. I it's usually because I'm. I'm interested or interrogating craft, and uh, and and maybe moving towards sound or technique more than I am in uh, the real heart or core of what's at stake for me personally. Um, so that's usually how how the poems poems fail. Uh, as a as a writer, published. You are a writer and you're published, just so you know. Um, what is your favorite kind of feedback from readers? Oh, that's a great question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that. Um, you know, I think I think the best kind of feedback or the feedback that really sort of emotionally hits me is when someone says like, I didn't know I felt that way. and then they realize that, I mean, it, sometimes it's just a, a real personal poem that I've written about my own life, and yet they are recognizing themselves within that. And that to me is always the power of poetry. And I think, I feel, um, I don't know, that that feels like magic to mm. me. Yeah, yeah, no, hey, good answer. In terms of um, risk, so you talked about several times, we even heard today in the video about risks that, that the importance of poets taking risks. Mm. So in the last year or since the pandemic, what risks have you taken and what risks do you think are critical given where we are as a society to take as a poet? Yeah, I mean, I think that risk is an interesting thing, right? It's like, what what am I what am I risking on the page? Where am I going with it? And I think there's a way to create safety. Um, there's also a way to create a poem that might be um, well received, <laughs> you know, uh, and then a poem that maybe has something in it that might irk some people. And I think that I think right now you know, the poets that I admire are really pushing those limits. And I, that's, I, I like to see that. I think that, I think that we're seeing some really creative ways of talking to these times uh, in, in, in poetry. Um, I also want to say that I think, um, I, I don't know, I don't know if this is risk, but one of the things that I have been reading in the, in the, in the contemporary poetry that I really admire is a lot of just amazing elegies and honorings. And I don't think, we, we, in poetry we talk about it a lot, but I don't think we do enough in a, as in a society is to really grieve on the page and celebrate people on the page. And the poets I know are just doing that and that has just been stunning. Hmm. Yeah, no, uh, from your lips to God's ears. Mm. Uh, I, I, another question, I think I might be interpreting this one just a little bit. Uh, your poetry inspires me on so many levels. I too deal with chronic physical pain. 
I'm curious if you have any guidance on how to incorporate this into new poems. I think the viewer is asking into their own work, your advice to them on how to manifest uh, that challenge in their work. Yeah, I mean, it's really, I would say that when I was in, um, I've been doing a lot better actually, um, which is interesting. I don't know if it's because I'm off the road or what it is, but I um, I will say that um, I, when I was in, when I was having vertigo and was in a, a place where I, I really couldn't write, I was able to start writing my dreams and writing dream poems and there's actually dream poems in uh, in the carrying, and it was a way of kind of living a life outside of my body because everyone says, oh, you know, bring presence to your body. You know, as we meditate, we think bring breath in, bring you know, center yourself in your body. But what if your body is in pain? How do you? I, I've always thought that, like, well, what if it's not my safe place to go? Um, and so, if you're really struggling if there is a way to almost get out of it and maybe even take a dream journal and seeing if you can write some poems from, from dreams um, that can kind of get away a little bit from, from physical pain, that might be helpful. It might be a way to just start. Yeah, no, good advice. I'm sure they appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see what else we got. Okay. Uh, uh, of course, we're talking to Ada Lamone, PBS Books, Trailblazing Women's Writers Project, National Endowment of the Arts. So excited to have you here. A few uh, minutes remain. A couple of questions. I think I'm interpreting this one a little bit too. Is the written word for you an instrument you play or something you lasso to say what you want? So I think what they're saying is do you grab the words and arrange them in a way or do you use them to say what you're trying to express? And I hope I interpreted that properly. Yeah, I, um, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think that the language doesn't come, you know, it, it comes in different ways. Like sometimes it doesn't even feel like language. It comes with a sound, you know, or it comes with a phrasing or it comes with a feeling or it comes with an image. Um, and something that's much more like a lyric than something that's sense making. So I don't really feel like it's ever something that's sort of constructed in a way that you might construct prose. Um, so it feels much more, uh, I don't want to say it's caught, but I think maybe from the beginning it's kind of caught and then it becomes crafted. So maybe it's a, it's a little bit of both. We'll see if we got another uh, question here. Uh, we got one more. Do you feel connection with the Nobel prize winner, Lewis Gluck through maybe through exploring right. nature and environmental issues in poetry. And this one comes from someone who was in Israel where it's 3 a.m. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, Louis Glick is an amazing poet. I'm so happy to see that news. Um, what an honoring. And I mean, poets just went, we were all shouting from the rooftops. Uh, it was just great news. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the things I admire about her work is that she does something different. I mean, every poem is very different. Every book is very different. Um, and I think in terms of eco-poetics, you know, I think I am deeply, deeply rooted in the natural world. And most of my poems, you will see, the natural world is, is, is ever present, if not pulsing through every page. And so I hope we're connected through that way um, because I admire her work and I um, I certainly want to keep writing about about the, the beauty and the... Um, diminishing, <laughs> diminishing uh, world, I don't want to say, you know, but, but to also to address even, even climate change in the work, um, as I think we should. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Heather, you got a question. I do. So what, um, another question came from the audience actually going along with beauty. So the question is, I guess they heard you this summer speaking about the importance of including beauty in your writing, mm -hmm. um, how important it was to do it for everyone. So the audience member asked for you to speak a little bit to expound on this concept of including beauty in your writing. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a craft talk I, um, I gave and I'm sort of still still working on, but I I think it's that, um, you know, we, we've been leaning towards clarity so much in our, in poetry because we need to make sense <laughs> and we need the truth to come out. But I also uh, want to make sure that we also make an argument for beauty. Um, and so that we're still leaning towards those 
incredible sound work and things that make a poem into a song and things that reverberate beyond just a clear, beautiful sentence um, so that we really keep working in the line. Um, and so for me, I think it's really important to keep working in beauty because that's what draws me to the page and that's what sticks with me. Um, I love clarity in poems. I don't get me wrong, um, but I do like the lushness too. And I like that idea when a line just sticks and drips in your mouth and it feels like you've eaten something delicious. Um, and I just wanna make sure we keep doing that as we struggle to get more and more truth into our poems. Clarity, lushness, and truth. We will let those be the final words. Uh, Ada Lamont, thank you so much uh, for joining Heather and me on PBS Books and the Trailblazing Women Writers uh, Project. Uh, it's been great in helping us to kick this off. Appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for having me. All right, stay with us and stick on pbsbooks.org for more information on what's coming up next. On behalf of Heather and me and Ada, thanks for watching. See you next time.